Anne-Marie Beecraft, a free woman of color, was a pioneering educator who at the age of 15 founded a school for black girls in Georgetown. She established the school in 1820 as one of the first educational endeavors of its kind in the District of Columbia. This was accomplished at a time when slavery was prevalent and the movement of free people of color was deeply restricted in the city. With help from a Jesuit priest in 1837, the school moved to a larger facility on Fayette Street, now 35th Street Northwest, only a few blocks from Georgetown University's campus. In 1831, Beecraft joined the first Roman Catholic Sisterhood in the Americas established by women of African descent. Among the Oblate Sisters of Providence and Baltimore, she became Sister Mary Aloysius, joining her love of teaching with her love of God. Now the building that once bore the name of a Georgetown priest involved with the 1838 sale of 272 enslaved peoples owned by the Maryland Jesuits will be named Anne Marie Beecraft Hall, in keeping with the recommendations of Georgetown's Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. Anne Marie Beecraft's legacy will be aligned with her noble quest to educate young people of color and her service as a woman of faith. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for your presence here today for this very special occasion. It's a privilege to be with you all and to have this opportunity to welcome our honored guests this morning, the Oblate Sisters of Providence. And we gather today on the occasion of Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia to reflect on the life of Anne Marie Beecraft, a free woman of color during the time of slavery, an educator and religious sisters, sister of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, who lived here in the District of Columbia and in Baltimore. And I wish to welcome everyone who has traveled to be with us today from Baltimore and from across our city and even beyond. Uh, I'd like to offer a special word of welcome to the members of our descendant community, those here today and those who are viewing this program online from places around our country. We remain deeply grateful for the opportunity to continue to engage with all of you in the spirit of dialogue and partnership. In recent years, our community has sought to more deeply understand our historical relationship to the institution of slavery and to address the manifest manifestations of the legacies of slavery in our time. One year ago, we dedicated the oldest building on our campus as Anne Marie B. Craft Hall, following the recommendation of our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. Today, we have the extraordinary privilege of hearing from members of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, which Anne Marie B. Craft joined in 1831 as Sister Mary Aloysius, and in engaging in conversation about their extraordinary courage and contributions since their founding almost 200 years ago. As we go forward, we will continue to engage our history and to work in partnership in order to contribute to a more just future. Now, to begin our program, I wish to introduce Sister Rita Michelle Proctor, who serves as the 20th Superior General of the Oblate Sisters of Providence to offer our opening prayer. After growing up in Washington, she, is, she attended the Oblates St. Francis Academy, and now has been a member of the order for more than 45 years. Sister Rita Michelle, we're honored to have you with us, and we're very grateful to have this opportunity to be together, and I ask you now to take this podium and offer a blessing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. <clears throat> and let us now bow our heads and lift our hearts and remember that we are always in God's holy presence as we pray. 
God of justice and peace. In your wisdom, you create all people in your image without exception. As we gather today, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that all your children are brothers and sisters in the same human family. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrong of history. Fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds, build bridges, forgive and be forgiven, and always work for peace and equality for all of your children. May the pain of racism and injustice never blur our vision in doing what is right in your sight. We thank you, God, for the life of Anne Marie B. Craft, a woman who, despite the challenges of her day in the face of racism and inequality, sought to provide a passport to the future through education of colored girls. Send your spirit among us today as we come together to remember, to celebrate, and to lift up the name of Anne Marie B. Craft, also known as Sister Mary Aloysius, Oblate Sister of Providence. In the few years you gave her on this earth, Lord, she showed her love for you by educating the children you entrusted to her care. May her life of service and commitment to education be an inspiration for us to continue to do all we can for your honor and glory. We offer this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that all God's people say amen. Thank you very much, Sister Rita Michelle. And we'll now turn to our panel and begin with two presentations. First, we'll hear from Dr. Diane Batts Morrow, Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Georgia, the author of Persons of Color and Religious at the Same Time, The Oblate Sisters of Providence, 1828 to 1860. And she has received a number of awards and recognitions for her important work on the history of the Oblates, including the Distinguished Book Award from the Conference on the History of Women Religious and the Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Prize. And she recently held a faculty research fellowship at the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. And following Dr. Morrow, Sister Marcia Hall the vocation director for the Oblates Sisters will share the history of the Oblates Sisters and their vocations, the lives of the sisters and their engagement and ministry. Prior to joining the Oblates two decades ago, Sister Marcia was a sociology professor. Now to lead our conversation, we have with us Dr. Marcia Shatlin, our Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of History in African American Studies and author of South's South Side Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration. She also served as a member of our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. This year, she is a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow and is working on her next book, From Sit-In to Drive-Through, Black America in the Age of Fast Food. Well, it's now my pleasure to get this started by welcoming our first presenter, Dr. Diane Batts Morrow. Thank you very much. I am limited in time, so I'm not going to go right into my presentation, but I warn you, it's about 15 seconds over my seven-minute limit. <laughs> I chose to talk today about Father Peter Miller, 
a Jesuit priest who was a very important uh, spiritual director for the sisters to underscore the Jesuit connection with the Oblate Sisters and Georgetown. Organized in Baltimore, Maryland in 1828, the Oblate Sisters of Providence formed the first black Catholic sisterhood in the United States. They fulfilled religious vocations in a slaveholding society that denied the virtue of all black women, slave or free. Ignoring such social condemnation, the Oblate Sisters demonstrated self-empowerment instead by defining themselves as women of virtue who dedicated themselves to serving members of their race. On November 4th, 1860, the Sisterhood learned that the Archdiocese of Baltimore had transferred their spiritual direction from the Redemptorist to the Jesuit order. Jesuit superior uh, Bourgeard Villager promised Oblate superior Gertrude Thomas to do whatever lay in his power for the good of the community. He certainly made good on that promise by immediately appointing Father Peter Miller as Oblate's spiritual director, who faithfully served the sisterhood in that role for 17 years until his death. Miller constantly attended to the spiritual formation of the sisters and children under his care. On May 29, 1864, the Oblate analyst recorded, our Reverend Director had since April proposed to establish the sodality of the Blessed Virgin in our convent to the great joy of the sisters and happy pupils who were allowed to make their consecration, this being the day appointed. The analyst observed that Miller, ever watchful for his poor children, had promised to give the sisters benediction on Sunday evenings in their convent chapel. On June 24, 1866, for the first time we had the happiness of having this great privilege. He only adds this one favor more to the many privileges for which we owe him an eternal gratitude. Now, under other circumstances, such constant expressions of glowing praise would appear excessive. However, in the context of past oblate experience of clerical indifference and neglect, these sentiments reflected their genuine gratitude for Miller's spiritual diligence on their behalf. The state of Maryland abolished slavery November 1, 1864. On March 1, 1865, the analyst reported, our Reverend Director, seeing the danger to which Catholic children are exposed of losing their faith, employed two of the sisters to take charge of a free school so that they might come and learn their religion and at the same time their learning would be attended to. This good father gave for these six months $75. The school numbers already 60 scholars. Significantly, from this time on, the oblate annals rarely mention Miller without adding some positive quality, goodness, kindness, thoughtfulness, devotion. His subsidizing the extension of the Oblate Education Mission to the newly freed black population permanently elevated Miller in Oblate regard. On August 7, 1865, the Oblate analyst referred to the original St. Francis School for Colored Girls, founded in 1828, as the Academy for the first time. The recent establishment of the Oblate Free School probably encouraged this change. Starting in 1867, Father Miller and several of his Jesuit colleagues at Loyola College would upgrade the Oblate School's curriculum to match its new title. On August 30th, 1866, the Oblate Sisterhood began a new mission trajectory. About this time, preparations were begun to open the orphan asylum that our good father had for some time been seriously thinking on. 
Now, while Miller had conceived the idea of the orphan asylum, early in the process he had sought and gained the cooperation of the Oblate sisters who would act as the agents in accomplishing it. Not only did Father Miller personally donate or solicit almost $2,500 for the care of the orphans, he also established a subscription system to support the orphanage. As Miller's advancing tuberculosis increasingly weakened him, Annals' entries from 1869 on frequently marked the sisters' joy at Miller's occasional rallies and distress at his lapses in health. We were agreeably surprised today by a visit from our good father. He was very weak and feeble and seemed hardly able to venture out, but we were all delighted to see him, countered by our reverend director was not able to come out now. His cough was very painful. We began today a novena in honor of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart for his recovery. On September 22nd, 26, 1877, Mother Louisa Noel personally called at Loyola College to inquire about Miller's health. The initial report of his improved condition heartened the community. But oh, alas, how soon was our joy changed into the bitterest sorrow and grief. That afternoon, a messenger from the college informed the sisters, quote, that our beloved father was dying and he wished the sisters, his children, and the orphans to pray for him. They immediately stopped work and went to the chapel as they all felt their inability to help him by any means except prayer. And this we offered up earnestly. An hour later, another messenger brought the sad tidings, our ever dear, revered father, friend, and true benefactor was no more. To describe our feelings is utterly impossible we felt for the second time in the life of the community, entire orphans. Now certainly the months, indeed years, of Miller's obvious declining health had allowed the sisters time to prepare for his death. Heartfelt gratitude, <coughs> excuse me, for the loving support their spiritual directors provided did not hide the essential fact that their historical experience had taught them. Their survival as a community of women religious depended ultimately on their faith in God's providence and their exercise of agency on their own behalf. Thank you. Good morning. morning. Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm here to talk about vocations within the Oblate Sisters of Providence, historically and currently. The most common definition for a vocation is a calling from God. Oftentimes when people think of someone with a vocation, they think of an ordained member of the church, like a priest, or a member of a religious community, like a sister or brother. We are not the only ones with a vocation, however. In his latest apostolic exhortation, Rejoice and Be Glad, or in Latin, Gaudete et Exultate, Pope Francis says, to be holy does not require being a bishop, a priest, or a religious. We are all called to be holy, by living our lives with love and by bearing witness in everything we do wherever we find ourselves. Thus, all Christians, by virtue of our baptism, have a vocation, the call to holiness. It is then up to each of us to determine how we live out that call, single life, married life, or religious life. Elizabeth Clarissa Lang initially chose to respond to the call by following a path to the single life, 
teaching the children of Haitian refugees in her home. She nurtured her spirituality through membership in devotional societies, prayer, and meetings with Father Jean-Marie Tessier, a Sulpician priest who was her spiritual director. Then Father Hector Joubert, another Sulpician priest, came to Elizabeth's home to talk with her about establishing a permanent school for the children she was teaching. Once Joubert suggested establishing a religious congregation, the path to becoming a woman religious was now open. Elizabeth Clarissa Lang became Mother Mary Lang, first superior of the community she helped establish, the Oblate Sisters of Providence, a religious congregation in which she and other women of color could serve the Lord and grow in holiness together. Let me state the obvious. Religious communities are able to grow through their ability to attract like-minded women or people to join them. These sisters, who were women of African descent, were concerned about their acceptance, which I read in two ways. Would there be other women willing to make a leap of faith and join them in this new mission? Would they be able or even allowed to flourish in what was often a hostile environment? They expressed their concerns about being accepted to Father Joubert, who assured them they were doing the right thing. The sisters' concern showed a very pragmatic assessment of their situation. They lived in antebellum Baltimore, where women of color were often treated as things to be used, not considered virtuous women who were worthy of wearing a religious habit. But they also subscribed to a providential spirituality that God has provided, does provide, and will provide. Consequently, they prayed and continued serving God's people as teachers. Those prayers and that work, their very example brought them not only more students, but more women eager to join them. One of the early ones was Anne-Marie Beecraft, who founded her own school before joining the Oblate Sisters. Her love of education and zeal for Christ came together as she answered God's call to become a woman religious. Sister Mary Aloysius was not with the community long, dying after two and a half years in 1833. But the notation about her in the annals indicates that she would be remembered fondly. She had a very sweet disposition, joining with it the firmness necessary to make her respected by the children. Pious, humble, and obedient, she took with her the regrets of all the sisters. The Oblate Sisters of Providence continued to attract women like Anne Marie, dedicated to teaching, a knack for leadership, zealous for Christ, and living in the area. Among them were the Noels, a mother and two daughters from Wilmington, Delaware. The mother, who became Sister Chantal, subbed for Mother Lang as superior when the latter was ill. One of the daughters, who became Sister Mary Louise, was elected superior for two terms. Sisters Mary Gertrude Thomas and Mary Teresa Catherine Willigman were both from Baltimore and Superior's General. Willigman is also considered the first oblate historian. About 10 years after the death of Sister Aloysius, external circumstances brought about the first pause in accepting new vocations. Father Joubert had died, and the archbishop at that time refused to appoint a new ecclesiastical director. The community struggled until Father Ann Wander, considered our second founder, asked Archbishop Eccleston's permission to be its new director. With the appointment of this young, energetic priest came new growth, both in ministries. The sisters started a new school for boys behind their convent, and in women aspiring to serve the Lord and grow in holiness as Oblate Sisters of Providence. In the late 1800s, priests really began a push for recruiting Oblate Sisters to staff their schools and orphanages for black children, both in and outside of the country. Not surprisingly, women outside of the mid-Atlantic states saw 
and heard about the witness of the sisters and began requesting permission to enter. This was reflected in the shift in place of birth for superiors. Mother Willigman was the last superior from Baltimore. Her term ended in 1897 until Sister Mary Annette Beecham, who began her term in 2001. It was during Willigman's time that the community ventured to Cuba, and the first Cuban to enter since Mother Lang was Sister Cecilia Ventosa in 1891. Today, in our 189th year, we are a small community. There are about 60 of us, and still diverse. The sisters here with you today come from places as far away as Emo State and Delta State, Nigeria, Accra, Ghana, Punta Gorda, Belize, Cienfuegos, Santa Clara, and Havana, Cuba, and as close as Philadelphia and Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, Maryland. The women in the pipeline are from Uganda and Cameroon. I am currently corresponding with new inquirers from Senegal and Kenya. We are still primarily educators, though sisters have served as pastoral ministers in parishes. St. Francis Academy, the school founded by Mother Lang, is celebrating 190 years of existence as the oldest Catholic school for black children in the country. Lean periods regarding vocations come and go. As vocation director, I have the same concerns that the founding sisters did. Are there women willing to make the leap of faith and join us in our mission? Can we continue to survive? But as an oblate sister of providence, I believe in a providential God who has provided, does provide, and will provide. Thus, I pray and continue to spread the word about the mission entrusted to us by Mother Lang and all the other sisters on whose shoulders we stand. Thank you for listening. I know I speak for so many in the audience um, with our deep gratitude for the Oblate Sisters for joining us, as well as many of us who, like myself, went to Catholic school and are so grateful to the work of um, nuns and sisters and lay women in our education. Um, when we think about the span of time that both of you um, guided us through between 1829 and 2018, um, I'm struck by some of the ways that the Oblate Sisters were in many ways doing the work that black women across the country were doing in terms of filling that gap. And so filling the gap between what the state would provide African Americans and what African Americans needed, filling the gap between what the Catholic Church was willing to say and then actually doing in terms of ministry for African American people of faith. So if you could both help us understand the work and the substance that the Oblate Sisters have provided when people have been ignored or pushed to the margins, what your community has been able to provide. Is that a look at me? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I will attempt to answer that question. I think one of the things that really impressed me as I have studied the Oblate Sisters over the years is the fact that they don't look to what other people think they should or could do. It was for them and remains for them sort of a direct line, what does God want me to do? And therefore, when individuals, uh, as late as 1904, it was common for um, uh, white commentators to say, I can't even imagine such a thing as a virtuous black woman. The sisters were aware of this really negative attitude toward them, but they did not absorb it. They knew 
who they were. They knew that God had a special mission for them. At a time when people looked askance at educating black children, uh, whether or not they were slave or free, the sisters understood that education was something vital. I, I also look at the sisters and, and as an initially an immigrant community mm -hmm. that very quickly started taking in um, a native born African Americans. But it struck me in particular recently as the uh, current occupant of the White House has gone on a tear mm -hmm. against peoples of color and immigrants that he demonstrates a totally uh, a total ignorance of history because immigrants and peoples of color have historically strengthened our communities they are not people to fear they are not people to hate they are people who like america a nation of immigrants have contributed so i feel that part of it is not listening to what other people think of you, but seeing what the need is and fulfilling it. And this is a historical oblate tradition. I, w I would agree. I'm an oblate girl. I was <laughs> educated by the oblate kindergarten through eighth grade. So I have personal experience of what that education meant. And the sisters are no nonsense. <laughs> they mean business. And I don't mean in that way that people have of when you say you're a sister and they go, oh, sister so-and-so used to smack me on the hand. No, I don't mean that. I mean about education. I mean, if you're going to be in this classroom, you're here to learn. And I'm going to make you learn. <laughs> and we're all going to learn together. We're going to learn. And I remember when I went to graduate school, and um, right now my synapses aren't firing, so I can't remember the name of the scholarship. I think it was the NSF scholarship that I, I earned. And another woman earned also. And we were like the only two people in the state of New Jersey who earned this scholarship. And we were both products of the same oblate school. I don't think that's accidental. Of course, I don't believe in accidents. <laughs> I don't. It's, there's, there's no coincidences. Those sisters, these sisters trained us to do, to move, to go, to be. And that's what we do. Regardless of whether there were four in the beginning or 60 now, that's what we do. One common experience um, I have found with other faculty of colors, a lot of us went to Catholic schools, and a lot of us um, found our passion um, for learning and education because of the models set by our educators. And I want us to think about the centrality of education um, to your mission and what we do here at Georgetown University and our capacity to support Catholic education, particularly in communities of color like Baltimore. Um, what are the ways that we can think about Catholic education with no boundaries, helping um, bring young people and nurturing them through the places in which this contact happens and this growth can happen? There's a part of me that would like to say, Sister Rita Michelle, would you like to answer this question? <laughs> Because she's been a principal for a lot longer than I was, and she may have some better and more ideas than I do. I need to think about that for a minute. Okay. I really do. I'm going to pass. OK. I will not challenge either of you on this issue. But I want us to think about the other, um, the other roles of community, especially as we not only celebrate Emancipation Day, but also think about the work of our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. I think it is powerful to think about the time that um, Beecraft joins the Oblate Sisters. And within a few years, we have the 1838 sale of 272 men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. um, associated with Georgetown. And so to think about those contradictions of the relationship not only among the sisters to the Jesuit community, but people of African descent to a slave-holding tradition within the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. What are the ways that we can understand that history um, as an act of faith, as well as to move ourselves in a place of reconciliation? An act of faith. Well, certainly th that contradiction is evident in our history because Archbishop Eccleston came from a slave-owning family. And so when Father Joubert died and the sisters needed a new spiritual director, 
He wasn't interested in that. He didn't see the point in that. So he didn't appoint a new director. So that, that's very much a part of our history. But as Diane pointed out, the sisters didn't go, you know, they, they didn't just say, OK, that's the end of this. We have to like, move on. So OK, so, so now how do we function without this person? We just go to this side or go to that side, but we keep moving. Um, so maybe that's the act of faith that you're referring to, that if we believe in a providential God, which we do, then God will provide the person we need. And eventually that person was Father Ann Wander. And I would like to add to that, that although we talk about history as being general movements, I, my own research has underscored the importance of individuals. The fact is that the United States, for all of its positive um, attributes, was a racist country from colonial times and into it, the early national period and frankly even today. But you still had individuals who could embrace the true sense of brotherhood that a Christianity, that the Catholic Church should, should espouse. And they could look past race and see worthy individuals and go out on a limb for them. It starts with Joubert. It goes on to Father Anwander, who was the redemptorist, who essentially got down on his knees and begged Archbishop Eccleston, who had nothing to do for the Oblate Sisters. And uh, he wanted to be their director. So the archbishop reluctantly consented. Uh, after the Redemptorists leave, you have the Jesuits and essentially Father Miller, whom I spoke of today, uh, who again, even if there are other individuals who are uh, racist, they see in the sisters, perhaps this is their act of faith, they see in the sisters a, a, a community worth supporting and going to bat for. And so I think, in a sense, I've looked at the sisters as a community that should never have happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of it, they start out in a, an, a southern city that is a slaveholding city. They start out uh, during the time of slavery. Uh, they start out as peoples of African descent in a society that is clearly only looking at privilege in terms of, uh, of Caucasians. Uh, they are women of uh, religious women who essentially uh, dedicate, give up the world, dedicate themselves to God, uh, live lives of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, no one thought black women capable of this. So their faith, the faith of others who believed in them, they've always worked against the odds, and I think continue to do so. And that's why, that, that's why our existence is the first miracle. <laughs> in a recent article in the Washington Post, they featured um, the sisters spending time with girls from St. Francis International Charter School. And um, it, was, it was a story about um, a narrative that I, I like the way that you spoke against, about you know, the number of young women who are drawn to religious life, and these kind of questions about numbers. But at the heart of the article was about forming a kind of relationship with girls and young women and showing them what is possible. And so in this present moment, what are the ways that um, your order and other religious women talk to young women about what is possible in vocational life? A vocation question. <laughs> Well, that was a start for us mm -hmm. to invite. Now, let me give you a little bit more background. Uh, Dr. Gaddy, who was their religion teacher, is the president of the guild, the Motherland Guild. So he has a relationship with us. And he and I had been doing what we called mini pilgrimages with his students for about three years. So those middle school students have been coming to our mother house. So that wasn't the first time for a number of those girls. And then uh, someone suggested to me, well, you could take one of those pilgrimages and make it into something that you can apply for a grant for National Catholic Sisters Week. Oh, 
bouquet, vocation <laughs> event. So 50 girls, and I'm not sure that any of us really knew what this was going to be like, but in a sense it was a, it was a magical day because the girls came in and you're talking about putting, planning something, it went just the way we wanted it to go. And the thing that, that we didn't plan for, which was a space of time after mass before the tours, was actually the time when the sisters and the girls just sat and talked to each other. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it is about relationship, it's about understanding the sisters are human too, understanding that, well maybe this is something that I could think about doing. When we, in vocations, we talk about the fact that for many years, we've stopped extending the invitation. And not just vocation directors, but priests, people in parishes, whomever. There was a time if you saw a young girl in a parish who was active in a parish, whatever you saw, you saw something in that girl and you said, have you ever thought about being a sister? And for whatever reason, those invitations stopped. And so this, is a way, this was a way for us to start extending that invitation again. Have you ever thought about that? If you go to our Facebook page, you'll see the video that America Magazine created for that day. And there is a girl saying that. She's saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I think I want to see what a nun's life is like. Bingo. That's exactly what we want. <laughs> she may never become a sister. Mm -hmm. But it's just the idea that now you've been presented with this. And you, OK, well, hmm, I, I, I'll think about this. There are so many other girls who haven't been presented with this option, whose parents are discouraging them from this option, mm -hmm. you know, who don't see sisters. So that idea isn't even in their heads. So those are the things that we have to do. Be more visible, encourage parents, to encourage their children. You know, when, when parents had eight and 10 and 12 children, mm -hmm. one child or two children even becoming a priest, a sister was wonderful. When you have one child, yeah. mm, not so much, <laughs> not so much. And, and I've talked to people who are working with me who said, you know, I have some girls who are interested, but there's nobody encouraging them. Their parents are discouraging them. So one of the things I'm doing is partnering with Destiny Productions to produce a video with young um, African-American vocations and their parents. Mm. So their parents can talk about what the vocation journey has been like for them. So that other parents can see, oh, okay, well I have had some of those same feelings, but they've gotten over that. So, you know, hopefully that'll be done by November. Because I think that's very important to engage the parents, engage the parishes. As vocation director, when I go into a parish and give a vocation talk, it's wonderful. But if the sea, if the ground hasn't been plowed with prayers for vocations, if there aren't people in that parish willing to work on a vocation committee, if parents are discouraging their children, then that seed is falling on ground. It's just not going to be planted. Mm. I, before I invite the audience to this conversation, I want to pick up on this idea of invitation. Because over the past few years, with Georgetown's working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, it's required the university to invite a community of people broadly known as the descendants for dialogue and for healing. Um, in your estimation, what can we learn from Beecraft's example, as well as the Oblate sisters, about how to issue a true invitation to racial reconciliation in this moment. I can speak from a negative perspective. That's usually the perspective I take, so please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it ironic. First of all, I am so delighted to be part of this celebration today. And it's ironic because I come from the University of Georgia. Mm. And the University of Georgia is gaining notoriety for its lack of a positive uh, approach to engaging community, including community, in trying to determine what the role of slavery has been in its history. Uh, and 
believe me, I will be spreading the word when I come back, to go back to Georgia, that there are places that have the courage and the faith to take on this issue of the history of slavery in your institution um, and not deny it. Our sisters have not only, maybe primarily, but not only taught black children, and maybe some of the sisters here can correct me. I believe it was in the 60s that we went to Michigan? Okay. And are there sisters here who served in Michigan? Sister Lynn Therese, Sister Charlotte. Um, and those were white communities. When I look at the, the pictures from St. Peter Claver in Minnesota, thank you. And though there are black and white children in those pictures as well. So we have been out there. We still continue to be here. I don't know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. but I, I, again, I think it's a question of, as, as Diane said, having the courage. Um, everyone's not willing to make that step. Well, please join me in thanking us for this part of the conversation. And now we have an opportunity if people have questions, I believe there are microphones that are available. Everyone's being shy. There's no one oh, yes. Right Anna? Hi, thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful. I, I, I should note, uh, last year I took, um, I was with a group of American Studies students at Georgetown, and we went to Baltimore. And these were all students who were mostly sophomores and juniors. They were thinking about doing, thesis, uh, doing a thesis topic. And at the African American Museum in Baltimore, there's a wonderful exhibit about the Oblate Sisters. And a number of students got very excited about that topic. It was something that was new to them. And as someone who's done amazing work in the field, are there directions that you might point students in for doing uh, research in the future on the Oblate Sisters? Uh, yes. Um, I am currently working on a volume uh, that takes the history of the sisters up to the mid uh, 1950s with the, I, I end with um, uh, nine, in 1955. This is uh, basically because this is sort of the height of pre-Vatican II church. Um, I'm thinking that the Oblate sisters who have a very rich uh, archives, uh, there are all kinds of ways, for example, what happened with quote unquote the civil rights movement what happened with the women's movement? What happened with Vatican II? How did that, what impact did that have on the uh, traditional uh, sisterhoods? And how did that, what impact did it have on the Oblate Sisters? And I think uh, from 18, or for, excuse me, from 1955 on, I mean, there's a lot of history. And as I point out, that the sisters do have a rich archives. And, something else. We have sisters here who can contribute oral uh, uh, memories, which would be something very vital. I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I'm old-fashioned. I tend to do written documentation. But there, is, there are rich opportunities in terms of collecting oral histories that would contribute to the history of the sisters. Let me also say that if you bring another group of students to Baltimore, please call ahead and come visit us. <laughs> okay? I give the tours and pilgrimages about Mother Lang, so just let me know when you want to come. Yes. Good afternoon, Sister Dr. I'm also interested in knowing how to bring the sisters back into our parishes, you know, in the archdiocese, because so many of them have left. I don't know the reasons why they left, but you know, it, when I see, or if I'm out with a sister, I'm sorry, my name is Christine Tolson, I'm a lay associate of the Oblates. But and if I'm out amongst and with them, the children remember, and they, they, they call out their names, and they, you know, they're so excited to see them. So how are we gonna get the diocese or archdiocese to help us bring them back into the school system? Well, there's a challenge in that 
Uh, most of our sisters are in their 70s and 80s, so they probably feel like they've aged out of the classroom. Um, I've heard sisters say that they don't know that they could deal with the young people who are in schools today. Um, when you have a small community, you wear several hats, and so it's not always easy to even come out to parishes. Yeah. So um, I, right now, it's, I understand what you're saying right now. All I can think of is the challenges. Just for me personally, to go to another parish on a Sunday, I lecture most Sundays. So I don't know, I haven't yet figured that one out. But I'm certainly open to suggestions about how to make that possible. Because I, I agree with you, we need to be more present. But it's not just a question of us sort of jumping in the car and, and going here or there. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? John Carr? and I'm with the uh, Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. I should know this, but can you say more about the life of Anne Marie Bancroft and her work, uh, her family, how she came to start the school, uh, how she decided to join the community, and uh, the impact it had? I would have to pull out my notes. <laughs> I'm not an Anne Marie B. Craft scholar, let me say that. So, um, I'm real, I think I'm working from your notes, actually. Oh, are you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like goes around, I, goes I see around. your name in here, starting with I'm thrilled. So, I think these are your <laughs> notes. I, some of your questions I can't answer, mm -hmm. like how she came to become an oblate. What I can say is she was a woman who had leadership skills at an early age if she started a school at 15. She was clearly interested in being an educator and she wanted to marry that with her faith and becoming a sister, becoming an oblate sister of Providence was a way for her to do that. Um, she had two sisters who went to St. Francis Academy. What is it? She became sick at age 15, when she started the school, she died at age 28. Um, I'm not sure that, that I know much more about her. What I can read this to you. It says that um, Father John Van Lamel mm -hmm. was so impressed with her work that he took it in hand to give her a higher style of school in which to work for her sex and race. So. She must have had a presence about her that drew people to her who said, let me see how I can help you. I can add a little bit, not uh, from Anne Marie Bancroft, but from her family. Uh, she came from a prominent uh, free of, uh, black family that was free before the Civil War. I believe her father or her uh, grandmother had worked in the um, Carroll family, which of course is a very prominent a Catholic family, which would could easily explain her uh, Catholic upbringing, her Catholic, um, uh, I guess her her, uh, her love of education, because this was one of the few areas where antebellum free black women uh, could start schools, uh, because it was pretty much a private concern, and so uh, I think she also may have had some encouragement from the Visitation Sisters if I'm not mistaken. Possibly. Possibly. We have no documentation for this. A lot of this may be oral tradition. Uh, but the point is that she grew up in a, um, a, uh, a, mil a middle class family, uh, exposed to education, and, it's not, and a Catholic family. So it's not surprising that she would be interested in both education and knowing about the Oblate Sisters wanting to join the sisterhood. Um, what's really exciting is that um, Shannon Williams, a scholar from University of Tennessee who's visited this campus, is in the process of writing the book about African American women um, and Catholic leadership. And um, with that, um, I want to again say thank you to our guests, our incredible guests who are here today. Thank you for making the trip and being with us. So with that, uh, we'll continue our day. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. We're going to prepare our stage. Let me thank again Sister Marcia and Dr. Morrow and Dr. Shatlin. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Janice Curtis Green, who will share with us a storytelling performance as Mother Mary Lang, the foundress of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Janice Curtis Green is an accomplished storyteller, an American griot, traveling and presenting stories and histories shaped by the oral tradition of West Africa. For 25 years, she's been sharing African, African-American, and multicultural stories at gatherings, festivals, churches, and schools. She's performed as a narrator with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and is also known for her portrayals of historical African-American women such as Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Phyllis Wheatley, and the performance that she will share with us today as Mother Mary Lang. She's the past president and life member of the Griot's Circle of Maryland. She's also a member of the National Association of Black Storytellers, the National Storytellers Network, and the Network of Biblical Storytellers International. Janice Curtis Green, thank you for sharing with us today. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur, Conseuse Ablette, Sœur de la Providence. Mon nom est Mary Lange, Sœur Ablette de la Providence. Je peux faire Paul en français, mais cependant, aujourd'hui, pour vous, je parle en anglais. <laughs> my, my name is Mother Mary Lang, oblate sister of Providence. Even saying it now brings a joy to my heart. I was born Elizabeth Clarissa Lang in the early 1790s in Santiago de Cuba. But the providence of God and his will for my life brought me to the Americas. You see, even as a young girl, I wanted to serve God. I just didn't know how. But what I didn't know, he knew. Now, it was difficult arriving on these shores as I came, as you say, with four strikes against me. First, I was an immigrant. I was a colored immigrant. I was a woman colored immigrant. And I was a Catholic colored immigrant. But when God has a plan for your life, he will and he did make a way. I eventually arrived in Baltimore and I was so moved by the beautiful children of color who were poor and uneducated. So with my friend, Marie Madeline Bellas, we began teaching children in our home. And we did this for 10 years. But at the same time, Father James Hector Joubert arrived in Baltimore. Now, he too was moved by the little colored children who knew nothing about Jesus. And he wanted to teach them their catechism, to teach them their religious education so they could receive their sacraments. But he soon found out that he couldn't do any of those things because the poor babies couldn't read or write. He heard about what we were doing privately in our home. And you must always be careful of what people hear about you. 
he had heard that we were doing a good thing in the name of God. So he came to us with a proposal to start a formal school. And we were delighted. And while we were talking, he heard from us what was in our hearts and how much we loved God. So he proposed that we start our own order as well. After 10 years, after 10 years of praying, our prayers were answered through Father Joubert. Now, he helped us draw up the necessary papers that we needed. You see, in order to present them to the archbishop, it had to be presented by a white male so that they would be accepted. So he helped us draw up the necessary papers and the documents so Archbishop Whitfield could send them to Rome. And surprisingly, he did. You wonder why I say surprisingly? <laughs> because there were those who taught, even in Rome, that people of African descent had no souls to save and no intellect to teach. So that's why it was such a surprise. But God stepped in and he sent those papers to Rome. And that was the beginning of the Abilate Sisters of Providence. Father Joubert later wrote in his diary that he saw the finger of God in our proposal. The finger of God, can you imagine? It was as if God had reached down from the heavens and touched me in my heart. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy did fill my soul. Something happened and now I know. God touched me and made me whole. We opened St. Francis School for Colored Girls in 1828. And at the same time, we began our novitiate and training. By that time, two more beautiful colored women had joined us, Roseanne Bogue and former student Alame Dujeman. And in 1829, July the 2nd, the Feast of the Visitation, we became the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Now, what we did in 1829 was both heroic and historic because the, the sentiment about women of color in an antebellum slaveholding state was that we were women of loose morals or that we were only fit to be servants, to take care of other people's children. But the Abilate Sisters of Providence were women of the highest virtue. And we were established to take care of and teach and love and provide our own children. So what we did defied both sentiments. I became the first superior general, Mother Mary Lang, Abilate Sister of Providence. And while I was superior general, the women came to join our order. It was as if women had been waiting behind closed doors all that time for a way that they could serve God. And finding out that we existed, the first permanent order a vowed Catholic, women religious of African descent sent them to us. I can remember Sister Louisa Noel who came to us in 1835. She had wonderful supervisory skills and became Superior General in 1844. There was another young woman who came to our doors, a beautiful young woman, Anne B. Craft who came to us in 1831, and she took the name Sister Aloysius. Now, she came to us, but she was no stranger to teaching colored children because 
She had been teaching colored children in the District of Columbia in her own school since 1820. She started at the mere age of 15, what some would consider a child herself. She was educated and articulate, but also devout and humble. Her sweet, gentle spirit made her a favorite among the children. And I firmly believe, had it not been for her ill health, who took the life of that sweet young oblate sister, in 1833, at the young age of 28, that I believe that Sister Aloysius could have risen to the position of Superior General had she stayed with us. Oh, the, the Ablay Sisters of Providence are filled with the stories of brave young women who came to our doors and became Ablay Sisters of Providence. I don't have time to tell you all of them, but I truly believe that it is the courage of those young women from our past, the wisdom of the Abelaide sisters of our present who are sitting in this audience today, and the hope of the young Abelaide sisters who are in our future, and the providence of God that is the essence of the Abelaide sisters of providence because they want to serve God. On July the 2nd, 2018, the Abilate Sisters of Providence will celebrate 189 years of service to God. And we will be here because our sole wish then, our sole wish now, and our sole wish will always be to do the will of God. J'abandon tout, j'abandon tout, tout à toi, mon rédempte béni, j'abandon tout. Merci bien. Thank you very much, Janice, and we're deeply grateful to you for your presence and your performance today. And I want to thank each of our participants in today's conversation, Sister Marcia, uh, to Diane, and, and to Marcia, and to Sister Rita Michelle for being a part of our gathering today. We're grateful to the Oblate Sisters for your presence and for spending this time with us. And to everyone here today, wish to thank you for being a part of this. As we close our program, I wish to invite all of you to join us for lunch, which will take place in the room just outside this library, and look forward to continuing our time together this afternoon. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you.